Thanks for coming here when the weather's so nice out there. Really appreciate coming, uh, you guys coming and uh, spending some time with us. I'm Charlene Makeley. I'm in the Department of Anthropology here. Um, thanks so much for coming to our final lecture of our epic social impact media lecture series this semester at Reed. Um, I'm so happy to welcome Aaron Yankee. Am I pronouncing it right? Yes. Yep. Um, who's bringing home our semester's inquiry into the possibilities, the politics, and the methodological dilemmas of media making that is aimed at both benefiting local communities and informing lo larger audiences in creative ways. Um, this semester, we've been exploring a growing nexus of interest among anthropologists and journalists and artists in producing social impact or social justice media across a variety of digital and analog mediums. So all five of our speakers have given lectures and then workshops the next day on Friday. So tomorrow at 1.10 p.m. in Volume 126, Aaron's going to offer our final workshop to Reed faculty, staff, and students titled Community Media and Ethical Engagement. So if you're a Reed community member and you want to join us, let me know. Um, that'll be tomorrow. Um, this series was actually three years in the making. It could not have happened without the generous support of the Greenberg Distinguished Scholar Program here at Reed. It was established on the occasion of Reed Centennial by this um, alumni, alumnus, um, a gift from Dean, uh, Dan Greenberg of 1962 and his wife and philanthropic partner, Susan Steinhauser. The Greenberg Distinguished Scholar Program aims to bring visiting scholars to campus to support the work of students and to provide faculty with the opportunity for in-depth intellectual exchange with a prominent member in the field. So thanks to Dan and Susan for their vision and generosity here. Um, I'm also really grateful to my co-organizer, Phil Bussey, who is actually co-founder of the Portland Mercury and former managing editor of that thriving alternative um, newspaper and website. Um, he's now the executive director of the Media Institute for Social Change here in Portland, and they've been running a seven-week summer documentary program here in Portland where students learn film and um, radio production skills while creating their own final projects. And I think it's on hiatus this summer, right? It is. Okay. Yeah. Um, but Phil is going to help us facilitate our conversation with Aaron today. So, And then finally, let me introduce... Aaron Yankee. Um, Aaron has had an incredibly eclectic and multimedia career. She's currently the program director of um, KBU Community Radio. So according to their mission statement, KBU is an independent, member-supported, non-commercial, volunteer-powered community radio station established back in 1968. KBU, they say, embodies equitable social change, shares knowledge, and fosters creativity by delivering locally rooted and diverse, what, what, diverse what? <laughs> Music, culture, news, and opinions with a commitment to the voices of oppressed and underserved um, communities. Erin's KBU work includes working with the um, on-air music volunteers. Um, she works as the KBU youth advocate. She organizes the training program, and she works with the audio archives there. She's also a volunteer music programmer and has been part of KBU since 1994. And then, as a documentarian, she works in multiple forms of media, audio, print, video. Her work focuses on, and this is how she puts it, themes of the untold story, which I like, the unheard voice, comparative experience across identities, and I love this, the importance of the clean and sharp edit. I think that's really important for our students to hear. Her many projects include 20 plus years of radio production, audio zines, self-published magazines, audio books, and quite a few demo tapes. Uh, recent projects include co-directing the 2015 documentary film, um, Arresting Power, Resisting Police Violence in Portland, Oregon, with uh, Julie Perini, who we know from our series and is a good friend, right? And Jody Darby. So I think we're going to hear a little bit about that. Great. Um, also, uh, a video installation of Every Now and Then You Win in the Streetopia art exhibit at the Luggage Store Gallery in San Francisco. And she has a chapter in a book. Beyond the Music, How Punks Are Saving the World with DIY Ethics, Skills, and Values. Chained to 12 trees. To the best of my knowledge, these are the only two that still survived. And 
I think we just got lucky. I think we got an aesthetic, like, pleasing planting. But as you can see, they came through here recently and they, they caught everything. I was driving by one afternoon and I'm like, they're gone. And I just saw like the work trucks, the chippers, and everyone's like getting in there and they're taking out some like really sweet oak. They're gone, you know? And then a few days later, I drove back by and it's like, all right, they trimmed all the branches that were overhanging over the freeway and um, they're still there. And see the other guy over there? <laughs> they're all right. The weird thing is, this is the healthier looking and the more solid from the ground level. But yeah, from here, that, well, the elevation goes up. No, it goes down there. I don't know. But yeah, that one looks good. But you couldn't see through this to traffic. Oh, wow. And personally, if I'm driving along the street, I don't want some kid to be able to throw a bottle into my window. I think like a good arboral barrier on all highways is great. They can either build a concrete wall or they can build arboral barriers call it it make a fortune off it take it to the wind it's green eat it make it edible but yeah so look at all these trees that they cut out of here and the only thing they left were our old buddies <laughs> <laughs> damn the luck every now and then you win they look good though huh oh they look beautiful yeah the other one has like about eight legs on it. It's got a bunch of side growths and stuff, but this one's got just the two. The main thing with these things is once they put up the fence, it stopped growing. What you need is the people getting in there and peeing on the trees. If you don't have people peeing on the trees, the trees ain't gonna grow. Now with the fence, it's gotta rely on rainwater and highway runoff only. It's a redwood, it'll make do. But when people used to be able to get up in there and live next to it, it was doing pretty damn good. It really was. Probably in the city I've planted maybe somewhere in the area of 75 to 100 trees. And yeah, it looks good. But yeah, these are the trees. So that's the story. It was fully, I think Eric Holdridge planted this one and Foley planted that one and the only thing I did was tell him get out of the car go put him in um, so that was Eric's Eric died he was a um, he died shooting footage for the snowboarding competitions for ESPN and he got buried in an avalanche and I always thought that was really messed up how like they would put him into the most dangerous position while he was shooting but he was one wild A. He was great. He was awesome. And then this is Foley's tree, which, as you can see, Foley's a little crazy. <laughs> and no matter what they try to do to trim this tree, this tree is insane. He used to walk around. He was one of those guys who would put, like, the aluminum foil on his shelter head so he couldn't get the messages. I feel how firm it is. It's like, it almost feels like plastic. And yeah, that's the Foley tree. That's the $2 well spent. And anytime you see a redwood tree for a dollar, go ahead and get it. End of story. All right. Um, if you didn't grab a sleep mask, this is now the visuals are over and we'll have the listening part. To me, it's not acceptable that Portland. And those, this is just a bunch of stuff. I'll explain what it is later. Because this is all you're going to look at if you don't have your glasses. Mess. Portland is such a great place, and we really stink as a place for people of color. The whole concept of white privilege is not that you yourself are doing something bad, but you have to look at, are you still continuing to go to the bank of unearned privilege and cash your check, which really belongs to all of us and not just one particular group? 
because if you continue to cash that check, then you are benefiting at my expense or any other person of color's expense in this city. Celeste Carey and Judith Mowry are co-founders of the Restorative Listening Project. The Restorative Listening Project is a monthly forum that uses storytelling to create a greater understanding of gentrification in North and Northeast Portland. Tonight at 8 on CBS 2, Chicago. With your world. We'll play this for Bruce. Just also for anyone that's not feeling well. Let's listen to Ray J and the Carousel with Bright and Shining Star. Weather today, in fact, the temperature coming close to 30 later this afternoon, probably anywhere from 28 to 30. Did you know that the Lord's Prayer has 66 words, the Ten Commandments, 179 words. The Gettysburg Address was 286 words. The Declaration of Independence, 1,300 words. And the U.S. government regulation on the sale of cabbage has 26,911 words. I'm actually going to throw the contortions on now. Actually, a few songs may play because i got some other things I need to do. Willie was a kind of barber where, you know, I, I would come in and I'd sit down in the chair and I'd say, uh, I want you to take a little off of here and a little off there. And he'd say, do I come down there to the University of Oregon and tell you how to write your papers? And I'd start laughing. And I'd say, no. He said, well, I'm the barber. I'm going to cut your hair the way that I want it. Our goal was to sell this thing. We were entering into the world of scumbags, and that's the point of the media. You're going to look like a doofus. So if you're going to look <laughs> like a doofus in the press, yeah, it might be a good idea to mess with them, even beyond the fun of telling them it's the most expensive record in the world and watching them not print it as a quote from the person trying to sell it, but rather as a, a factual thing. He was under the impression that it was entirely true. And when I told him, of course, this is bullshit, he got really upset and gave me this whole rigmarole about why bankers wear suits. Why do bankers wear suits? <laughs> <laughs> because they show that they're, like, serious about money. And he said, you don't want to bank with the guys with the sense of humor. That's what Scott said. <laughs> I would say for me the highlight was just the opportunity to connect with people where they're at and that's usually a sentence that we use in the healthcare settings you know we always say this like harm reduction is meeting people where they're at you're literally doing it you're outside you're in a tent like you're connecting with people you're not wearing a lab coat you're not wearing a name tag you're just dressed in your own clothes you're in outdoors in the neighborhood connecting with people you're not presenting with a title and like you know interacting with people that way um you're just human-to-human -human connection, interesting discussion. People just felt free to talk about whatever they wanted, ask questions. It just felt like everyone was on the same level, and it had a powerful impact on a lot of people. And not just in terms of preventing overdoses and saving lives if people overdose, but just in terms of people feeling like there's this whole group of people who care about us and who show up every night and connecting on a human level 
had a significant impact on people and their desire to take care of themselves. Still to this day, I mean, I saw some of our regular guests. One was a Sunday evening because I visited the supervised injection site that recently opened, and I saw some of them, and still that connection is still there. It's just so special to have the privilege of doing that every night and really connect with, uh, for me, the most powerful thing. So that's just a s kind of a mix of sample of stuff that I have been doing. Um, the back going backwards, um, I started doing a podcast with Alec Dunn, who's a nurse who's been doing harm reduction work. Um, uh, with you know, as a nurse for six years and doing harm reduction work for years before that. Um, so the podcast we have is called Bright Spark. Um, that was Mary Lou. She had done a pop-up safe injection site in Ottawa. Um, she now lives in Vancouver, BC, um, and doing the Canadian National Nurses National Harm Reduction NERC, Nurse uh, I think Alliance maybe some. Uh, um, they have a lot of pop-up safe injection sites happening in Canada right now. Um, that were started a lot outside and then had to try to move in or close when the winter came in. Um, before that was an audio zine excerpt um, a, quite a few years ago. Um, some friends of mine found a acetate record, which when you, if you're recording in a studio, there's like a machine that can just make like one copy of a record and you take it home and you kind of listen to it for mixes. And it was the acetate of the first Velvet Underground record. Um, and so they bought it for 50 cents at a yard sale and then had this huge media circus, hilarious. Um, eBay was new and this whole thing about um, selling it as the most expensive record ever sold. And it... Uh, the guy who bought it at the most expensive record price ever sold was like, I'm sorry, I didn't mean, uh, someone bid on it on my work computer. Uh, so um, it was hilarious. Like, he was really freaked out. Don't tell my girlfriend. It's a direct quote. Um, so they resold it later. And, um, but it just the whole media circus of that. Um, then there was a little, the haircut clip was from the House of Sound documentary, which was a record store uh, on Williams, 60s, 70s, 80s, closed in the 90s. Um, but Willie owned the building, owned the shop, owned the grocery store around it. And so that was a little bit about him as a character. The radio stuff, um, I lived in Chicago for four months and I had an internship at This American Life and Chicago is a huge city to explore. Uh, I lived there in the winter, it's my first real winter. Before that, Portland is the furthest east I'd ever lived. So that was kind of different and exciting. Um, so there's a lot of times where you just didn't wanna go out and walk around and walk around and walk around. So um, the Chicago radio was amazing and all the different ethnic communities that had a presence on the radio was really exciting to me. Um, so that was, that's a longer, I think it turned out to be like eight or nine minutes of that piece. Um, and then the first bit was a radio show that I did for about 10 years with Jody Darby, who is the arresting, um, the third arresting power person. And uh, over the years, a few other, probably about eight of us in total, um, who did radio shows every other week and then at once a month and then that was too much even just about kind of whatever wanted to. Um, and so that's, that's kind of a sample of the work um, and then I can just run through some influ influences because that's what people always ask in band interviews so um, I, and I can talk about these later more if you want to. Um, but the main influence is that uh, I'm gonna die. We're all gonna die. And if you're not doing something with your life, then what are you doing, you know? So um, 
the first person that was my age that died, I had a kindergarten classmate that drowned. So it's been very present for me in my whole life as one of these things that, um, you know, I don't, it's very interesting to watch people like start to have friends that die. Um, part of the nature of living um, subculturally and counterculturally is that we are on the edge and pushing boundaries. Um, and there's a lot of trauma that people deal with, with self-medication and booze and just living on the edge and also just our current capitalist bullshit of not being able to go to the doctor. Um, so uh, wasting time to me is like the worst thing you could do, but wasting time to me looks like working a job. <laughs> And I know I have to work a job, and currently I have a job that I really love and that aligns with my values, but I spent 20 years, it was a very conscious decision for me and many of my friends that we were going to be semi-retired in our 20s and 30s as opposed to fully retired in our 60s and 70s, and how that looked to us looks really different. So wasting time, you totally could have looked at us and been like, you're just sitting around wasting your time. What are you talking about? But of course, we're like being really creative in ways that it's hard to see when we're just, you know, sitting on the corner all day, every day. What are those kids doing? Um, so that is, uh, you know, that's a that's a that's a main influence. Um, being open to like uh, humanity, other people, big influence. <laughs> um, it's also, it's kind of funny now, it's real dicey because people uh, that you don't expect or like, you know, have these, you know, people are much more upfront these days with their racist and bullshit values. So there's some being up, you know, of like, hey, you know, I'm, you know, I'm really into other people and what they're talking about, but I also, people really tend to like to argue with you or like have their views that they wanna throw down your throats or whatever, and I'm like, I'm not into that. Like, I love hearing about your story. Even if you have fucked up views, like, tell me your story, how'd you get there? Like, that to me is curious, but this like fighting, arguing thing, I'm not into. So being open to other people for me means more like that, of like sharing experiences. Um, and in sharing experiences, we kind of get to this like philosophical, um, Walida Imarisha is amazing local treasure. Um, she's been doing a lot of work. She's a long-term prison, prison abolitionist, social justice organizer, and she's also a total deep science fiction nerd. And um, her and um, Adrian Marie Brown did this uh, story called, story, they edited a book of stories called Octavia's Brood. Um, that the premise of that is all organizing is science fiction. And first we have to be able to use our imaginations to think of a world without slavery, without prisons, without capitalism, without, as Ursula Le Guin said, the divine right of kings, and then work towards it. So, um, so imagination and that time for like creativity and art is just as important for social justice as the actual social justice work of going to all the stupid meetings you don't want to go to, coming to the weird lectures on a beautiful day, uh, you know, like all that stuff. Um, let's see. And resources, influential, um, which I was thinking about that a lot with Reed because there are some houses that are now very nice that used to be total just disgusting, awesome, fun places to be. And, you know, I think like 17 people lived in the, you know, four bedroom house or something like that. Um, but those folks were really good at coming here and using the library, using the swimming pool, making friends with people in the cafeteria and getting food, hanging out on the lawn where, you know, like you live in a house with 17 people, where's your private space? Your private space is a read. There's empty rooms, I'm sure, in this building. You can just come in here and just like hang out and write a letter on one of these cute little tables or read or something, you know. So um, so thank you, Reed, for being an excellent host over all the years to all of us. Um, but we are surrounded by resources in this city. 
and um, you might not think of them as resources or you might not think of them as your resources, um, but they can be. A lot of it is just like not asking permission and a lot of it is just like looking at it with different eyes. And what resources do you have that you're not using that you can actually share with other people? There's a lot of stuff that people just hold on to because it takes more effort to get rid of it, but like things need to just keep moving through the world, and you know you might not need it anymore. There's tons of people that need stuff. There's things that are out of date for you that might not be for other people. So also just like resources, keep them moving, because if you don't, then they're uh, you know they just get rusty and unloved in your house and it sucks. Um, and then. Also, this is kind of a, Phil's asked everybody about community, so I'm gonna just beat them to the punch here. Um, but I think um, that that community and that relationships is like the reason of doing all of what we do. Um, there is a woman named Alice Nutter from Chumbawamba, and she would talked about her band as not being a band, but as being a gang. And that, to me, is a little bit easier to think of, like, it's like community is this kind of amorphous like here we're all in community but I don't know your names and I'm here yapping at you but you know I don't know if it's I don't know what's resonating or not until later on when we have a beer at that the where is it the proper pub, proper pub. that's where the beers are after the proper pint eight o'clock um, and then I can stop talking and then I can hear what you have to say which is the community part of it um, but thinking about community as a smaller like scene, and punks talk about that, supporting your scene all the time. And that means that we are actively engaging in the lives that we're all trying to build. And you know, we build up our lives, we tear apart our lives. We build them up, we move, we do all kinds of things. And uh, there, so my community and my scene is really like my true wealth, my like, what I have built with my life, which is not something that you can see kind of anywhere except for, um, I don't know, maybe you can. Um, and yeah, so scenes bigger than family, smaller than humanity, communities kind of in there in the middle. Um, and that, just that feeling of like, I don't know about them, but we are all in it together. And we, with through the media, I feel like that I try to make and that we all, the people that I think of in my scene or in my community, um, is that whatever world that tries to come down on us from the top down for the like marginalized and poor people and whatever kind of shithole categories that they try to put us into is that like that that is why that I am optimistic that they won't ever win because it doesn't you know like people can rain down shit on top of you but we are all here and we're all in it together and media is what actually make it so I don't have to have a direct conversation with everybody that I'm all in it together with I get to like make a documentary and then it gets to go all over the place or like people can see it in 10 years or listen to the speech whenever they're listening to it or whatever. So that's my yapping part. And now it's the question part. Let's talk. Let's talk. Yeah, let's, I'm gonna pull up some chairs here um, and ask a question. Okay, that's good. Uh, what if we pop the lights on up here actually? So it's funny, I, I, was, I, I never started talking about Kapu, but I um, want to talk about Chumbawamba a little bit. Chumbawamba! <laughs> All right. Who knows who Chumbawamba is? Yay! Um, <laughs> I mean, it, they quit, I, I get knocked down, I stand back up. Oh, that's, yeah. If you think of Chumbawamba as a one hit wonder, well, no, then I mean, that's what you know. But. I mean, I think that that's, that's where they're popular. And I was, right. I was on a, a, a panel down in Aspen for a conference down there, and one of the Chumbawamba. Folks is down there. Gilbert. Yes. Yeah, he lives in Washington actually, but okay. he was yeah, oh that's so cool. And and it's when they're 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 from Ireland. England. I, England. Yeah. And it, it definitely <laughs> was it was a surprise because I did really know them just that one song. Uh -huh. I didn't realize that they they lived in Calcutta, they're a collective that they they were really 
performed in response to Margaret Thatcher. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was remarkable. Yeah, they're fantastic. They're, um, yeah, dig deeper, <laughs> dig deeper. Chumbawamba is rich. Uh, so, so obviously music has, has been, is an important part of your life. Yes. Do you remember your first album that you bought, not that you... Uh, the first album that I bought, um, I was with my grandparents, and uh, was in. We were in Hawaii because my great aunt lived there, and there was some ABBA Hawaii seven-inch. Like, doesn't make sense that ABBA would be singing about Hawaii at all. They're from Sweden, <laughs> but I'm. Sh they went. They got. You know. So yeah. So I was like, this is. What's this? Cool, seven minutes. So I bought that. Uh, your first concert? Um, I saw a lot of live music when I was like three, four, five, like a lot of bluegrass kind of folk stuff. But um, the first um, first punk show that I ever saw was in 1985, um, Seven Seconds at the Club Cantel in Sacramento. Um, and then probably first like big concert. I feel like there's probably something in like 1980 or 81, but I don't exactly remember. Lots of like big stadiums. <laughs> uh, and, and do you have a preference for, for live shows or for recorded music? Live, live, live. Yeah. Okay. Music should be felt. Um, let's talk more, let's talk more specifically about Ibu. Um, 50 years, right? 50 years, yeah. <laughs> totally. Um, this, is, this is a really, this is such a broad question. I'm sort of going on a little bit of a fishing expedition with it, but, but what does Cable <laughs> give to the city? Uh, cable gives to the city an opportunity for people to speak for themselves without having to go through gatekeepers. Um, it gives people access to, um, it gives the people who are participating there access um, to just freely explore what it is to put something out for the city and get response for it, whether it's thoughts or music or, you know, taking people on a journey from one thing or to share their passions. Let's, let, let's unpack that a little bit because um, in some ways what you're talking about is, is, is that's for the producer. Yeah, there's a producer and a, and a uh, recipient, listener? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. but. There's, but there's benefits to both, but yeah. Okay. So that the first one was the listener benefit and the city benefit. The second one was like, we get to live in a city where people get to be fully realized creative people by doing this. And, and you said, I mean, there, there, you said, you know, there's freedom for, for having to, to go through the gatekeepers. That said, there is a limited number of hours in, on, in the day. So you, I mean, there's a limited number of shows that can happen. Um, I would say that that used to be true, but now with podcasting and the internet, there is no limit. Okay. There is no limit. And where, where does that leave Kebu then? I mean, in, in terms of uh, is, is Kebu then a relic or is Kebu uh, a different? I mean, if, if in terms of existing yeah. within. If we podcast. decided not to have internet presence and decided not to embrace podcasting and embrace like anyone can do this, then we would be a relic. If we just strictly thought about broadcast only, then. Um, yeah, then we would just be useful, you know, or like, I mean, there's value in that, but taking the model of like, are you interested in something? Come in, make it, sh learn the skills. We teach you the skills for free, learn them, share them with everybody at a certain point, you know, you're off on, training wheels are on, you're off on your own. We do some evaluations here and there. Then we ask you to be like, hey, can you teach this class, teach other people? So it's very community oriented in that way. And then with the internet and podcasting, um, people can record stuff on their own and then just send it to us. I'm hoping to do, um, this is a, a project um, of trying to figure out places. I have some ideas. Some people who have ideas about their lives changing and getting involved in this don't know this yet, so that's why I'm being a little cagey. But um, there can be hubs all over the city where people can create media and then like, and we give you permission to put this on the second stream, which then we can get, you know, take those that like 
are produced or work with people and then get that on the air. And then the people on the air we can broadcast to so they can stumble across it and be like, there's a whole place for this on the web. So they work really well, I think, together. Let's, let's talk a little bit more about that. I've struggled with this throughout my, my 25 years as a journalist and an editor. Uh, the, 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 the balance between populism and elitism. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, the number of columns I've been pitched, uh, and, and and at a certain point, you know, I, I think that there is a quality uh, that that comes about from having five, ten, twenty-five years of experience and knowing how to write an article and put out an editor. Right. That said, I do want to also have, be able to have an open to other voices. There's always there's a balancing act. Right. Because how do they get there without the twenty-five years of experience? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, let, let me put a finer point on the question then. Is there a point in when there's just too much media? And there's, 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 there's too many podcasts, and how do I choose what to listen to? For you personally, me personally, us personally as individuals, I would say yes. For us as humanity, no, 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 no. Not at all. Okay. Yeah. Like, yeah, I can't listen to podcasts. Constant. I mean, then you'd never get out of bed. You'd never do anything. You'd never like how. What kind of life would you lead to then be able to create your own podcast? You know, it's. And and, and um, let's take a different angle on that that, that topic. Then um, we're talking that really it, it, it's we're we're talking we're living in this bubble as we're talking because in the last twenty years, uh, the ten thousand or so radio stations in America have gone from five thousand owners to eighty percent owners. I mean, it, the, the, the consolidation of radio has been massive and fast. Absolutely. Uh, Clear Channel, Disney, and yeah. um, I should know the third. Yeah, so should I. No, that's more TV. Uh, real fast, I'll just do a quick footnote. 1996 Telecommunication Act, internet's coming around, and, and the Clinton administration and the Congress says, hey, there should be an availability to own more than one media station in, in, in the market. Clear Channel at that point had 40 stations. Within 10 years, they had 400 stations. Um, yeah. So question being, how does, how does KABU, uh, th how does that change KABU's mission or programming? Does that change what you do, or do you just keep doing what you're doing and not worry about what's happening in the rest of the, the at that point, we worried about what was happening in the media landscape because there were more people coming to us. Like, I just got fired from my commercial radio job where I had a little bit, I had 90% playlist, but I had 10% freedom to bring in local artists. Mm -hmm. So those folks were coming to us. Like, I've been replaced by a robot in the Midwest, and I don't even know where, but there's a robot that's controlling, you know, 200 of the 400 stations. Um, exactly. Good old Charlie. So, um, so at that point, there was like, okay, how do we look at, you know, making more space, doing more? So we have this ridiculous schedule of like every, you know, like there's every other week hosts, and then there's the same shows with four different hosts, and then there's things. So it's really, if you're not used to non-commercial radio, then you don't know that the station that was playing, like, you know, Hillbilly Country Songs is the same one that has the Farsi show on Sunday. That's the same one that has the, like, um, police accountability show. That's the same one that has the gardening show. You don't know exactly, because you're just flipping around and you don't pay attention to the numbers. Um, so um, at that point, we did really look at a lot of that and, and kind of made this ridiculous schedule and trying to fit everything in. But with the internet and with also being able to archive things and people to go back to it later, it's a little bit of like yes to everyone. Like there isn't, um, people are not, people will, they're still territorial about the air because you know the air is beautiful and mysterious and exciting to be on the air and see what happens. But, um, but if, the, if the creating the media and sharing your passion of whatever it is, it's like great, we don't have a show for you on the air but you can make a podcast, people are like great because they understand at this point what that is. There was a lot of kind of resistance 
like, what's a podcast? What do you mean? And you're like, you can listen to it at any time. You're not stuck to this weird time. Like, there's a lot of freedom in the internet. There's a lot of freedom in being able to set your own schedule. And if you want to be on every day, be on every day. I don't care. If you want to be on, like, once every six months, do it. So um, in that way, I think the structure of podcasting being um, web only works better for people's lives because as media consolidation is happening, as gentrification is happening, and as capitalism is happening, we're getting to where the media can be created by people who are rich enough or retired enough to have spare time when you're counting on volunteers. Um, or um, disenfranchised enough to like be looking for work and trying to get job skills. Or, um, you know, there is that, like, I had this kind of, you know, my friends and I had this beautiful moment where we could be semi-retired. My rent when I moved to Oregon was 80 bucks a month. You know, hell yeah, you know. And I lived, in, you know, in a closet with like seven other people. You know, like I made these choices, but these choices are not as available to you all as they were to me and your creativity is just going to have to look different than mine and ours did. But for to get back to the KBU with the space of people like the people like you and I that get paid to do media are becoming, you know, we are becoming less and less. So it's like, do you want to get a story out? Do you want, how are you going to do it whether you get paid or not? And like KBU is kind of a place where that can still happen and that you can actually teach yourself how to do it without paying to go to school and creating a portfolio where then you can, you know, at least try to, you know, at least you're in the running to get the kind of jobs that you and I have. Absolutely. And, 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 and I want to talk a little bit more about how, how unique is Portland in term, uh, terms of that independent media? I mean, you have KBU, you have XRAY FM. Uh, Freeform. Freeform. Um, the CAT now, the Community Alliance of Tenants, has their own right. station. Um, the Q Center, I'm not sure what happened with that one. Like, the, there was a low power FM opening and the stations, so it's like all these micro communities could have their own stations with their own programming for places like in New York and Portland where um, it had been really clogged up by stations who were in. And KBU got in in 1968. A lot more people started in the early mid 90s and then this last um, low power FM um, you know, blossoming. So I think we're really, really unique. And, and um, where does that leave your optimism or pessimism about radio being a viable platform for expression, for originality? Um, can you give a five-year or ten-year prediction? Um, I think it is in a really great state. It is cheap as fuck to make radio compared to video. Mm -hmm. um, it is, um, there's, there's an app called Anchor on your phone that, or it's on my phone, not necessarily on your phone, but you can just like press this button, now your phone's a microphone, mm -hmm. press this button, it will take a music break from Spotify, boom, there's a podcast. Then you can turn that into somewhere, KBU, get it on the air, you know. Like there's all these ways that it is literally in your hands at this moment to make this media, and then there's all these ways to share. And I don't see radio and podcasting really as being that different. You know, but the, the radio, like the broadcast, there is that beautiful like scanning the dial and being surprised as what's there. And podcasting, you have to know it's there, or you have to opt in, you have to press play, so you can look at all these lists, but you're the one that has to like, take the chance and press play. So you don't have that cool, like, I could stumble across anything. I could stumble across, like, a lady who's super obsessed with the Green Bay Packers and then also plays polka songs, you know? I did not know that. But yeah, that was the old lady who was, like, had the cabbage regulations from the, yeah. She has a great, ch or she did in 19, or no, 2001. Yeah, yeah, Chicago. <laughs> um, and, and really, from, from hearing you talk, the line between radio as actual in your kitchen, in your car, physical being, and podcast uh -huh. sounds really blurred. Yeah, I don't think of them as too as that different because hmm. it's listening. Fair enough. Yeah.
Let's let's uh, switch gears then towards um, film, which you also have been involved with. Um, I'm going to start the same way: optimistic or pessimistic about what film can do in terms of uh, both from the producer standpoint of being a point place of expression, and then from what the audience is giving. Yeah, um, I am not a real film person. Okay. I am a collaborative person, um, and so sometimes, and so the two examples of the film that I played are like. How do you tell an audio story that has to have visuals to it? Because both of those started with the audio. Mm -hmm. And that with Arresting Power was like, I start with the audio. I'm a sound person. Here's the sound. And then Jody's like, well, let's just have these really beautiful shots of Aaron Campbell's apartment building. And the, you know, and it, so it has to give you something to look at. And then with Jimmy's story, you know, it's like, oh, we want a video for this installation. And it's like, Oh, everything I did was looking like stupid PowerPoints, and you're like, ah, I don't, ah, this sucks. So um, I asked uh, uh, Julie and Jody and Pam Minty from the Film Center, and I were in this kind of monthly meetup group, just like talking about art, and um, it was one of their ideas because there is a annual winter solstice puppet show that happens. Um, of folks that I'm friends with, and they're like, well, what about like shadow puppets? And then that's how that happened. So it's like, yeah, this is, this is much better than trying to get people to tell this, or have like representation that isn't, you know, that just looks like a postcard, you know? No, it's, it's funny. But so it's yeah, so video, I don't know. Okay, so <laughs> let's talk about collaboration then. Yeah. Um, Humans, <laughs> you know, we're a difficult bunch of people. We're a difficult bunch, as people, I should say. Are you good at compromising your artistic vision? Um, I yes, I am, and also, um, I don't necessarily. Um, vision is so um, overrated. I think. People have a vision, and then what are they going to do to get there? But it's like, well, it's in creating this vision together. Like, it changes. It changes what's going to happen. And if you stick to your vision and you don't let the influences come in, then a lot of, sometimes it works out real well, but sometimes it just sucks. You know, if you, you know, because it's like, it's that process of collaboration, I think, that like, it's like you bring something to it that you never would have thought of that makes it richer. You know, and I have w I have ninety eight percent experience with that with collaboration making things better, than the stick to your vision and have it like be um, be a visionary thing. Um, but also like you know I like people I like collaboration I like the idea of sitting around together and um, coming up with. I mean Julie talked about it a little bit like we would sit in her office and we would use her projector and, you know, have the Google Doc open and they, like, change that word, do that, move that. And, you know, I am a, because I'm a sound person, I can edit sound and I, I love editing. Editing is the best part of what you're doing and I think we'll talk about that more tomorrow. Um, but I can't edit film. I'm really slow at it and it just feels like I'm trying to do it with oven mitts on my hands, you know. But I would sit there with Julie or Jody while they moved it and were like, move this here, let's try, it. oh, that sucks, let's try this, okay. And that's like, that's what makes it all uh, rich, I think. And, and, and um, this seems like this might uh, dovetail into to the chapter that you're working on in the Pop Punk Book Theater World with DIY puppet uh, Gilded Valley. Probably, I kind of forgot about all right. that. So, I mean, I'll, I mean, well, let, let, let me let's try, let's see uh, it. <laughs> How are punks saving the world? Are they still saving the world? Are there still punks out there? Oh yeah, even in this very room. <laughs> um, a friend of mine, who has a, who's in New York, um, he was talking about. You know, we're very general in speaking, okay? But it's like, of our age group, you know, that punks are the only people that know how to actually get anything done. He was very upset at the time. Um, I do not stand by that as a full statement, but um, how do you do things with no resources? 
I know how to do things with my resources. I know how to do things. Um, you know, you find space, you find the cracks. You're used to kind of um, just making things happen. Um, and there's a lot of like, I don't know what I'm doing, let's just do it anyway. Like you don't necessarily uh, wait to be good at something before you try it. You just, you know, time is short, life is short. You know, the buses stop running at 12.30, you better get it done before, you know, catch that last time at home. Or you don't catch that last time at home and finally everybody's out of the way and you can get some stuff done or, I don't know, yeah. There's very, there's a, there's a lot of freedom in uh, living your life the way you want to and having other people to do that. And again, sharing resources. No, I, 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 um, I, I just for my tips on, on you and your work, and, and I've been talking a lot about your, your background, where you came from, and, and we're in a, an esteemed college. <laughs> Uh-huh. Um, well, I went to Humboldt State University in Arcata, California, where um, I also, I lived in Eureka, which is the lumber town across the bay there for 13 years. I moved around California um, with my parents split up and I moved back there. But I went to college because I did not want to get a job. Straight up. I didn't want to start working because and it was the last, I felt like I was the last generation of people that had, I had decent enough grades to get grants. California is like, everyone should have a higher education and it should be available to people. And I got in on that and worked the whole way through so I didn't have any debt and that was totally possible then. And, um, and it was awesome. It was great. Um, I met people that I am, you know, really tight with to this day. Um, I forget my taste for not working. <laughs> um, but not not working, just not like spending time in exchange for money doing something that you hate or trying to figure out like, you know, how to not, how to minimize that influence. Because, you know, like I also had to pay rent the whole time and, you know, there's, uh, money is important for things that I want to do in my life. But I don't need a lot of money, and I don't need, um, yeah. So, so yeah, so, but I always knew also in college that, like, I wasn't, I just, I studied history, and I worked at the, at the college radio station, and it was like, what am I interested in? That's what I'm going to study. I'm not going to worry about where that takes me. Or like trying to get a job out of here because I've always had jobs. I can always get jobs. You know, it's the the money part and the um, and the art life fulfillment part weren't really tied together. And then they became tied together um, because I volunteered. You know, I moved to Portland in 1994. I volunteered at this radio station. Um, I learned how to do stuff. I got some paid jobs. I came back and started teaching people. There were job openings that kind of worked out. The guy who had my job had it for 22 years before I got it. So it's not a job that opens very often, right. you know. And then it's like, oh, this is perfect for me. I can totally do this. So, um, so I feel like I really lucked out and, and, in that. Why did you move to Portland? What role was it that brought you here? Um, well, Arcata is right in the middle of San Francisco and Portland, so we would I'd spend, uh, I would say, two-thirds of my travel time going south, but a third of it going north. But at that point in the early 90s, I mean, Seattle was a much, much more thriving, uh, at least well-known right. music scene. Portland was, was, was much smaller. There, there was La Luna. There was a few, a few clubs mm -hmm. around at that time, but, and EJs, yeah. um, but, but nothing. Pre, pre EJs, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, EJ's was still a strip club when we <laughs> moved here. And the first time that EJ's was a punk club, it was hilarious to watch the people come in who paid their $5 as if it were a strip club. And then they just looked around and then they walked right out. And we're like, all right. You know, we just started counting. We're like, that's, that's been like 15 people. Like, all right, that's another 75 bucks for the bands. This is awesome. Um, but uh, 
we had friends uh, in Arcata. There was a really tight, tight community, tight group of friends. And at a certain point, everybody left. And some people ended up in Olympia. And so uh, I would go, we would go to Olympia and visit them and spend more time, stop in Portland on the way, but go to Olympia as opposed to, you know, we, like we never went to Seattle. Um, and then we'd spend a little more time in Portland and a little less in Olympia and then a lot of time in San Francisco in the Bay Area. Um, but Arcata, if you have been there, is about, at the time was like 6,000 people population. And also I had grown up there for a significant part of my life. And it was just like, I gotta get the fuck out of here, you know? Like I don't, I don't wanna know everybody on the street. And I wanna know that. And so um, for me personally, I had the choice of moving to San Francisco and I would work at the rainbow and I would volunteer at Blacklist and I would live with these people and I would do this and blah, blah, blah. Or I could move to Portland where I knew two people and had no idea what's gonna happen. And so I chose Portland because <laughs> if it all fucks up and falls apart here, like I can go to San Francisco, but if it fucks up and falls apart in San Francisco, then I'm like, fuck, where am I gonna go? Uh, you know, because then you're defeated and you're like, uh, and that's not when you're necessarily apt to take a chance on um, life surprising you. If you could travel back to 1994, is there a career or advice you'd give yourself? Um, probably just little things like uh, the closet that I lived in. There was like a closet and then like an outhang to the house. And I probably, so I had to put a floor in there, so I probably would have like spent more money and time on that floor, <laughs> you know? And knowing like, yeah, and then, you know, there were parts where there were nails sticking out or like I would never let that person move into that house, you know, or like, oh, that, no way. Or like get out of bed and go to that show or me, you know. But in general, like, no, you know, I did good. I'm here, this is fucking weird, but, <laughs> you know, but it's great. How long have you been the program director for how long then? About uh, six years ish. Okay. Yeah. And so the guy before it was there for 22 years. Yeah. Was there somebody in between? Uh uh. -oh. Wow. But, and, and, and you, in those six years, you did take a sabbatical? Yes. And, and what, what happened on your sabbatical? Uh, I went to the river about three times a week. I took this August. The Washougal, the Sandy, the Wilson, like, uh, yeah, I love swimming. Um, I took off August, September, and October. So, you know, that's like the perfect, August is the perfect month in Portland. Um, so I just didn't do anything. I went to the river, I had friends traveling through, I hung out, I just like caught it red. It was awesome. Um, we, uh, I was working on a, book with uh, two people, one who lives in Portland and one who lives in Berlin, a uh, coffee table book about Dead Moon. Um, so spent a fair amount of time doing that and we did a Kickstarter which happened during the sabbatical time and um, just did the book layout and work and stuff. So that was like the project. And Dead it Moon is just for, because it's that, that's old school Portland. Yeah. Dead Moon is, was a fantastic band, uh, garage rock band from like 87 to 2007. Um, Fred and Tootie Cole, married couple, uh, were 40 when they started and Andrew Loomis was 27. Andrew was uh, just hanging out at a bar kind of guy, uh, you know, Bartender hanging out at the bar playing drums. Uh, Fred and Tootie. Fred was in a bunch of uh, 60s bands. Um, the Lollipop Shop, um, The Weeds. Um, kind of did the classic 60s, like trying to go to Canada to beat the draft. Bunch of drama in there. Ran out of gas in Portland. <laughs> stayed. Um, met Tootie, you know, saw Tootie the first day was here. They got married a year later. Um, they ran a music store together. Um, they started playing music together in 
83, I think, with the rats, maybe earlier than that. Um, had three kids. One of them lives a couple blocks away. Um, and then just, yeah, built their life on running a music store, playing music, um, fiercely independent, um, and very, like, fuck it, it's done, it's got that recorded, it's got to get out, we're going on tour, who cares, mistakes, whatever. Like, it's part of the charm is not spending a lot of time on um, worrying about the details or worrying about it. It's like, we made this thing, here it is. Throw it out to the world, move on to the next thing. And, and it had a, a, a certain following. Yeah, you yeah. Know, sort of legendary following, but, but, but maybe not... Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Of that same ethos. Uh, yeah, of the same time for sure. Um, the, but also like didn't want to roll that way. They're like, we we have what we need. We have family. We have business. We're happy. They built their own house in Clackamas. Um, they, yeah, it's like there's nothing that the major label could give them that they didn't already have. Um, I want to take some time because I'm going to have to throw some questions. But um, some quick short answers. Uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Let's see. I don't know if I do either. Book or magazine recommendations? Oh, um, uh, Emergent Strategy by Adrienne Marie Brown is an awesome book about community organizing um, that I am reading slowly. Um, everyone should read Gentrification of the Mind by Sarah Schulman. Uh, it's totally great book. The premise, this is not a short answer. Um, her premise is the two most gentrified cities in America, San Francisco and New York. Um, the gentrification process started because of all of the people that died of AIDS and that who, you know, their partners were on the lease. Um, the partner died, the person who was still alive didn't have any right to the apartment and then people moved in to these cheap places. Um, so she talks a lot about that, a lot about um, ACT UPS and, and AIDS activism and remembering the artists that have died, as well as when you get a city who used to be able to move into a city and um, you could go to art school or you could live among artists and criminals and get your mind kind of opened that way. Um, as there is less room for artists and criminals and influences, um, that more and more people end up going to school and more and more people end up with the same reading lists and then they teach, then they go on to be teachers who teach the same books and then that is the gentrification of the mind and there's just less and less influences in there. And then she also is like, there are ways, you know, in having reading groups and teaching ourselves and asking that question that we can open things up to other influences. Um, but that book is amazing. And Sarah Schulman's amazing. Um, those are the two that I think everybody should read. Um, and then I think it's good to just rest your mind and not feel bad about like reading comic books or things that other people might think of as garbage because you gotta rest your mind from heavy concepts sometime and just like read stories because they're enjoyable or they're interesting or someone's funny or you know. Um, Something like that. Music recommendations? Oh, there's always so much good music. Um, Dead Moon, of course. Um, the, there is a band, there's a hardcore punk band called Harem from New York who um, sing in Arabic and really have a lot of really, I think they're really awesome, important band, but they're playing at Pickathon this year which to me is surprising. I'd still, I'm not gonna go to Pickathon. I don't really like camping with 300 other people. But um, if you end up at Pickathon, they're gonna be there. And I think that's really cool. 